We are back in our study on the patriarchs, the men who built Israel. And uh, I was thinking as I got into this today, more or as I was preparing to get into this, um, when you have a really big family, who makes the decisions? When you have lots of brothers and sisters, who make, I wonder how many of you came, came from a big family? I did. You came from a big family, yeah. We didn't have a choice, but mama and dad did is what we did. That was, that was the end of it, huh? Yes. That was the end of it. In some families, the mother functions more like the head, some the father more like the head. And sometimes when they don't, then the oldest, you know, makes the decisions or the most vocal. <laughs> sometimes you just have that member of the family who always jumps out there first and then people just learn to acquiesce. Yeah. <laughs> So as we, in fam, every family is different, you know, somehow they find their way for better or worse. But when we talk about uh, Jacob's family with his 12 sons and one daughter, um, when Jacob doesn't make decisions, then the sons step up. And it's interesting to see how this happens. And especially in today's chapters, as we feel like um, with Jacob, there's a leadership void. And when there's a void, then people have to step up and fill that void. Because his mama wasn't there to tell him what to do. Oh, my goodness, Jacob. Okay. On your sheet, because of his sin, Jacob was separated from his brother Esau for 20 years. Years later, because of his favoritism toward his son Joseph, Jacob was separated from Joseph for more than 20 years. But God planned another dramatic family reunion. I say that because we've already experienced the one with Jacob and Esau. Well, we're going we're gonna to see another one here real soon. Jacob sent 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy grain during a severe famine. We talked about this last week. He kept Benjamin, his youngest, behind. While in Egypt, the men met their long-lost brother, whom they did not recognize. Joseph, however, did recognize his brothers and tested them by accusing them of being spies. He confined them for three days and then released all but one, sending with them grain for their households and requiring them to come back with their youngest brother. He also secretly returned their money to their grain sacks. Once home, they told Jacob all that had transpired. Jacob refused to send Benjamin with them to Egypt. One of his sons has been left behind, but he is not going to send his youngest. He thinks that Joseph is dead. Benjamin is his other son from Rachel, his favorite wife. Okay? That's where we're at as we rejoin the drama in Genesis chapter 43. <clears throat> First seven verses. Now, the famine was still severe in the land, so when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said to him, <clears throat> Dad, remember, hold on, <laughs> remember, <laughs> Judah. The man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send him, we will not go down because the man said to us, you will not see my face again unless my brother is with you. Israel asked, why did you bring this trouble on me? By telling the man you had another brother. They replied, the man questioned us closely about ourselves and our family. Is your father still living? He asked us. Do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How are we to know he would say, bring your brother down here? Oh, what attitude do you see in Jacob's response to Judah? How is he treating his son, who is just relaying facts? It's all about Jacob. It's all about Jacob. All about, he's still selfish. He's still selfish. And, and given bringing this trouble on me given his past why is this ironic maybe i should put it this way who has created most of the trouble in his own family Jacob. <laughs> all along the way he's been the one to create trouble right with his lying with his deceitful schemes with his favoritism by putting his favorite son in harm's way all along the way he has brought trouble how can he blame his sons for this 
Okay, you know that person. Don't don't say their name out loud. But maybe they're a family member. They can blame everybody for everything that happens in their lives. It's their parents' fault. It's their teacher's fault. It's the police officer's fault. It's the judge's fault. All these people, it's their fault, right? Where are they never pointing the finger? Jacob, did your sons bring all this trouble on you? No. No. Lida, when is he going to take personal responsibility? I don't know. Mm. <clears throat> you know, when people are that kind of liar, they, they believe their lies. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Lida says sometimes people believe their own lies. They tell them long enough, they start to believe them. Right. Verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy along with me. See, Judah's stepping up, understand. Send the boy along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. As it is, if we had not delayed, we could have gone and returned twice. <laughs> then their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift, a little balm, a little honey, some spices and myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. Hmm, sounds good. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once. Okay, again, Judah stepping up, trying to fill the leadership void. Given the brother's past, why is Judah's suggestion exceptional. What do you remember about Judah? Judah was the one who suggested that they sell Joseph into slavery. Yes, yes, yes. Instead of killing him. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So, he's trying to somehow redeem himself now. He's thinking of the greater good. He's not part of a devious plan. Now he's trying to fix things. In other words, even though we see only this much character development in Jacob, Judah seems to be growing up. This is progress. You know, with some people, progress is enough, right? Okay. Well, and he had such guilt over what had happened. I'm sure he had a lot of guilt. Yeah. Over those. Can he atone for his guilt by doing better now? Right. What does dad say <clears throat> after this? And may, this is verse 14, God Almighty grant you mercy before the man so that he will let your brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Does your Bible say anything different there? Deprived. If I am deprived. Is this a statement of, I should say Jacob, not Joseph. Is Jacob's speech a statement of faith or is it something else? Pity party. pity party. It is something else. It is a pity party. He's very fatalistic. Remember, here's the man who said at the end of our, our last lesson, there's no hope. Fine, take, take the boy. This is a little mama's boy growing up. Yeah. <laughs> but again, look at where the focus is when he says that. It's on him. He's actually not thinking about the boy's welfare. He's thinking about what? His own He's possible grief. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Okay. On your sheet, I put a quote from Shakespeare. Suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. Boy, when these brothers go back, they are... Uh, they are feeling all the guilt as we get into this again. Verse 15. So the men took the gifts and double the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal. They are to eat with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and took the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were frightened. 
when they were taken to his house, they thought we were brought here because of the silver that was put back into our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. So they went up to Joseph's steward and spoke to him at the entrance of the house. We beg your pardon, our Lord. They said, we came down here the first time to buy food, but at the place where we stopped for the night, we opened our sacks and each of us found his silver, the exact weight in the mouth of his sack. So we brought it back with us. We have also brought additional silver with us to buy food. We don't know who put the silver in our sacks. <laughs> it's all right, he said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. The steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet, and provided fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. So, again, Simeon, some time has passed, was still being held hostage in Egypt. He, this is Jacob's other sons, including Benjamin. They were turning to buy grain. And why do they fear the worst case Scenario. Because Jacob is their daddy. <laughs> Interesting answer. Okay, probably. <laughs> okay. Because the assumption is when they come back that um, they may be suspected as thieves. It was spies the first time, but now maybe he's going to remember it and think they're thieves. I mean, what a trip <laughs> back to Egypt this must have been. Anxious. How do you sleep when you're especially anxious? What a trip this must have been. And they get there, and instead of, what, getting to present themselves and buy grain, they're taken to the royal official's house for a meal? What's happening? What's, what is going on? They're on pins and needles. Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> this is the end of it. This, I, I, love, I, mean, I love all that stuff. And steal our donkey. And take our donkeys. He's going to do everything including taking our donkeys. They tried to explain themselves to anyone who would listen. Even the steward. Joseph's house manager. I wonder, do you think the steward was in on the secret plan? But look at verse 23. The steward seems to have some, steward that says it's some inside information. Yeah. He knows Joseph well enough to know. Why these foreign does. shepherds are being brought to the house for mm -hmm. a fancy meal. This is unusual. We haven't done this before. Back of your sheet. Verses 26 through 34. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house, and they bowed down before him to the ground. He asked them how they were, and then he said, How is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? You know that he wanted to hear the answer is yes. They replied, Your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, Is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. After he had washed his face, he came out and controlling himself said, Serve the food. They served him by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. Because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. The men had been seated before him in the order of their ages. From the firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Why do you suppose Joseph did not reveal himself to his brothers even after he met Benjamin, what does he want from them? What's that? I said he, they want, he wanted a come to Jesus meeting. A come to Jesus meeting. 
wanted to make sure that they had changed. Wanted to see if they had changed. Okay. Hmm. You might have just been letting them sweat. You know, it does seem like he's toying with them a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, even this this idea that he would seat them from the oldest to the youngest. That must have been spooky. Yes. Yes. Because they're already in an anxious state. Mm -hmm. And they're all about the same size. How does he know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's giving them them clues of his identity. He is. They're not getting it, though. They haven't figured it out. But you can imagine with every bite of meat (laughs) shaking like a feather. Brother, but a sign mother got the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joseph's really laying it on thick here. Okay, we continue the story. Chapter 44, verse 1. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack along with the silver for his grain. And he did as Joseph said. He's setting them up. As the morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after these men at once. And when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for his divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. What does it mean, divination? The devil. Reading the spirits. Sort of. Okay. That Joseph's magic, yes, and able to determine these things. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them, but they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouths of our sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said. Let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Boy, he is setting them up. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Dun, dun, dun. At this, they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? (laughs) Sort of reminds them of the dream he had. Right, right. He's saying to them, I have access to the spirit world. I know things. (laughs) He's having a blast, isn't he? He really is. (laughs) He's got them right where he wants them. What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who is found to have the cup. But Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who is found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. Uh Uh-oh. Why did Joseph put the silver cup in Benjamin's sack? And what was he hoping for by putting his brothers through this grief. Why is he doing this? Looking for the truth. Looking for the truth? Revenge is sweet. The younger his brother would stay behind one. Okay. He he definitely wants more time with, especially the youngest brother. Revenge is sweet. (sighs) Don't they kind of deserve this? They do. Mm Mm-hmm. Other, you know, you think about it. Okay, there is emotional distress that he's caused them. But other than Simeon, none of the rest of them have really suffered. Right. Except in their own minds. Except in their minds. Joseph holds all the cards. Number eight on your sheet, Benjamin is the most innocent of the brothers. This was also his first time in Egypt. How do you suppose he felt about this chain of events? I did not do this. Scared to death. Scared to death. Country goes to town. Wide-eyed. What is happening? 
Confused? He's saying, you know, there's brothers, there's older brothers. I'm starting to believe you. We, I mean, we are doomed. Verse 18, then Judah went up to him and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Judah's stepping up. Judah is stepping up in this study in big ways. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, do you have a father or or a brother, and we answered, We have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me so I can see for myself. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our younger brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, he has surely been torn to pieces. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Great job, Judah. How does his speech here compare with the one he made back in 43 when he said uh, to his father, send the boy along with me, we'll go, and I'll guarantee his safety. Is he making good on it? Was he willing to make the sacrifice himself? Absolutely. For whose sake was he willing to make the sacrifice? His father. For his Isn't father's sad, sake. Sad, sad, sad. That his father put him in this position. Yes. Mm -hmm. He is showing more maturity than old dad. All right. The bar is kind of low. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good point. The one who sold his brother off to slavery is willing to stay there and serve as a slave in Egypt. So he has He's kept his word. What does this tell you about his maturity? I'm so proud of Judah. Great character arc here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that he even puts it that he, he's not going to bring this kind of misery upon his father. Okay, home stretch. Are you ready? The big reveal, chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified. At his presence, does anyone have a different word than terrified? <laughs> Troubled. Stunned. Stunned. Speechless. Speechless. <laughs> Why did he wait so long to reveal his identity to his, his brothers? Why did he finally do it? Did he get what he wanted? Yeah. Yes. I think when Judah <laughs> stepped up and gave the speech, and he saw in there repentance, regret, that he got what he wanted. That's why he can no longer control himself. Well, and the fact that he sent everybody out is why I think they didn't really know what he was doing because uh, they heard him crying, but they didn't know why he was crying. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the Egyptians. Yeah. So talk about their response to this revelation. They were terrified. Keep, why? Why? Well, by this time, they knew his authority. For one okay. That could be a problem. 
Keep going. In the moment. I realized that something had happened in that family and Benjamin would be just as well off there as it would with, it would with him, I think. Okay, but the brothers are not happy about this at all. No, but Judah is, and he's uh, the speech maker. <laughs> Are they shocked? Well, they thought he was dead. They did think he was dead. And by, I mean, they, since they hadn't heard from him or anything, he didn't send a letter home saying, guess where I'm in prison. <laughs> <clears throat> Are we supposed to be happy? Are we... So, what? This is either very good or very, very bad. <laughs> Just be going away. <laughs> it's a great moment. Verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you? For two years now, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to reserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire household and ruler, ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his, brother talk, his brothers talked with him. How could he... And here's, here's to see if you got the meaning. Here's to see, okay? This is your test now. How could Joseph kiss and embrace his brothers after all they'd done to him? He had God's forgiveness in his heart. He had God's forgiveness in his heart. Well, he also recognized that it was God who put him, that everything they tried to do bad to him, God was trying to do good. Well, that is really big of him. But didn't he say it four times to them in that speech? God did it. God did it. Somewhere he had to have made peace in his heart with what was going on because... You know, he'd get in jail, and then he'd be lifted up, and then he would go over there, and then he'd be lifted up. You know, he couldn't deny the blessing of God. Right. Where right. is that verse where he says, you meant it to bad, and, but God meant it for good? Yes. I, where is it? <laughs> that, that, that happened, yes. It's a little bit further. Yes, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. But, but. I was so glad Nancy brought up that question last week. Where is God in this? Because Joseph knows where God is in this. He may not have understood when he was falsely accused in Potiphar's house. He may not have understood when he was in prison for a few years. They say hindsight is 2020. Now. Now he understands. It's like Daniel, or these people when they have their dreams. They may not understand what's happening, but later on it'll be re God will reveal it to them. Yes. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't feel all this stuff. Of course, who am I anyway? But I kept thinking, Are you guys really catching this all right? <laughs> You're giving Joseph a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. And yet God worked through it. We God don't always through. see God's hand working in our lives. Yes. And so many people have been blessed with that verse, right? Yes, yes. Look, and just what we read here, I was blessed. Mm -hmm. 
he just let them off the hook. He just let his brothers off the hook. He forgave them. Well, that's what God does for us. Forgiveness is letting someone else off the hook. Let God do the disciplining if it needs to be done. When we forgive, we don't forget because that's impossible. Everything that you've ever experienced is in that noggin somewhere. Your brain is like this memory strip. Everything is in there. So you can't, you just can't forgive and forget. But when you forgive, you're letting them off the hook. I don't think Joseph had a wine made attitude. No. No. He seems to have gotten over that real quickly. Yeah. It sort of goes back to what Joe Cox said. Didn't, didn't come out a better man not being under Jacob's. But, but, uh, the, Genesis 45, 8, and, and some of the other verses that I tried to pause so that you got it, so that you heard it four times. What do they reveal about Joseph's understanding and acceptance of all that happened to him? Who gets credit here as the first cause? Who got Joseph to where he was? Say it. God. God did. God did. Yes, like all of us, Joseph is a turtle on a fence post. Yes? When you see a turtle on a fence post, what do you know? Someone put him there. Somebody had to put him there. God put Joseph where he was. Why, Joseph says, why did he say this? So that he could save, the whole save many lives, he said. So that he could save many lives, including, hold on, the lives of his own family. If God doesn't get Joseph from point A to point B through prison, then Joseph can't save the lives of his family. That's God. That's God for you. Okay, ready to wrap it up? When the news, verse 16, reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt so you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh had commanded and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. Do you think that on the way back the brothers said, let's kill Benjamin? <laughs> I think they're past that. I think they're past that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what he said to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they were leaving he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. I like that. <laughs> he knew them too well. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. <laughs> Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they had told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. When he received the news about Joseph, what did Jacob learn about hope? I wonder how he thought about his, what had happened all those many years. You know, he said, how could you? Lida's looking for a confession from the brothers. She's looking for a confession at that point. Well, he must have known it was a conspiracy. When we left Jacob at the end of our last study, he was hopeless. Where is he now? There's always hope. There's always hope. We, we sang the song quite a bit in the last couple of years, and the children loved it, Waymaker. And, and in the bridge, it says, Even when I don't see it, you're working. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. God was working during all this time. Jacob couldn't see it. Jacob couldn't see it, and that's why he was losing hope. But now, now his spirit has revived. So many times when we are in the pit, when we are down in the dumps, when we are in despair, if we'll just hold on a little bit longer, give it two years, give it five years, guess what? You made it. There might be a big difference on the other side. Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The thing about being in the valley is you're going through it. You don't stay there. The Lord is with you. There is hope on the other side. Hold on, Jacob. Hold on, Christian. God is working. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are, are so much better at planning our lives than we are. We thank you that you have given us through uh, examples like this one, hope for the future. We can always be hopeful because we have you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.